Hi y'all, let's talk a little bit about the DOJ's taint. So, uh, as I'm sure most of you are by now aware, the uh, Department of Justice through the Southern District of New York has gone after Michael Cohen, who is Trump's lawyer. And they have seized a lot of his files, some of which include, uh, potentially, uh, attorney-client communications between him and the president and perhaps between him and some other clients uh, that he might have. And the, the Department of Justice wants to use something called a taint team. And I've had this conversation with a number of people on uh, Twitter and other places, and I've seen in the media um, you know, people who are for it, people who are against it. Uh, Alan Dershowitz and I uh, agree on this subject. Um, some civil libertarians, ACLU, and I don't seem to be in agreement on this subject. I've seen lawyers argue that this is perfectly copacetic. And uh, in the process of doing that, th put forth a lot of arguments that are just, uh, well, they sound nice, but they're gibberish. So let's just be clear here. There is never any reason at all, whatever, for uh, the government to use a taint team. Now, before I actually argue my point, I have to throw out some defensive arguments because these are common objections that will be brought to my attention. Uh, people will bring them up as though something um, meaningful has been said, one of which deals with the U.S. Attorney's Manual. Uh, it's a nice fact to discuss in this case that there does exist a United States Attorney's Manual, and it does in fact tell United States attorneys and uh, the employees who work for them uh, what to do, some general policies. The issue there, though, is that it's legally irrelevant. There is nothing you write in an internal policy memo that confers on citizens various rights. They have constitutional rights and uh, things that are enforced through the common law and various statutes. If you want a good example of how, of how useless this kind of argument generally is, go listen to a case called Plumhoff, uh, Plumhoff against Rickard. And um, it's a slightly different context, but it's a constitutional issue, which of course this is because it's search and seizure law, and ultimately that depends upon the United States Constitution, Supreme Court cases, uh, various uh, district courts, I'm sorry, various uh, courts of appeal throughout the country and whatnot. So there's a constitutional issue uh, that is there, and then there's the attorney-client privilege, which for uh, centuries upon centuries has been viewed as being sacrosanct because the ability of a lawyer to represent a client in court depends upon the lawyer being able to get information from that client that is not going to be disclosed and then used against the client. I mean, that would be a really great tool for the government. Hey, uh, you go get yourself an attorney and, and you know, just, uh, you know, open, open your mouth and say whatever you want, just spill the beans and then come and go, all right, attorney, we're going to dragoon you into the prosecution. What did your client tell you? Ha ha! Conviction? No, that just doesn't work. Anyway, so in there, the, uh, this was about a killing, I think. Uh, some guy died, a police officer had killed him for various actions, and uh, the uh, attorney, maybe it was just an injury, I don't recall. The, the, the detail, it doesn't matter what the details are. Someone was hurt, someone was injured, someone is claiming their rights were violated, whatever it is. And uh, the attorney for that party was arguing that this uh, officer violated the policies of his agency, which the government concedes. Yes, it's entirely true. Uh, it seems to us to be the case that uh, he did not act in conformity with the department's policies. But the government's argument on that point was, but of course that's legally irrelevant because this court, not a police department, sets constitutional rights, interprets the Constitution, fixes the party's rights, and enforces uh, the rights that people have against the government. The government doesn't get to um, abrogate these by writing policies, and they don't get to impose extra obligations on the government by writing policies. Uh, it's just legally irrelevant. Another example of that is um, the Constitution of the United States versus the Constitution of the several states. Uh, the state constitutions are often much more protective of, in of individual liberty than the United States Constitution is. The United States Constitution itself sets the floor below which the government may not go in, uh, with respect to whatever it's doing, uh, but, you know, if a state wants to be more generous than that by having in its constitution stronger protections, you don't get to walk into court and say, well, it violates the U.S. Constitution because the people in this state have come to depend upon this rule. Mm, whatever, the con U.S. Constitution uh, doesn't protect that, even though the state constitution does. A good example is uh, searching through trash, uh, you know, when you put your trash out to be taken away. Under the federal constitution, the police can search that without a warrant. In my state, the police may not search that without a warrant. The fact that a person disposes of their trash is not an invitation to the police to come in and search it uh, to look for evidence of crime to arrest people. 
So that kind of thing. It's not an abandonment of uh, one's property interest in having their trash be taken to where it is they are uh, putting out there to be taken. Uh, if the police want to look at it, it's fine. All you have to do is go persuade a judge that you have probable cause uh, and get a search warrant. So um, the policy manual in the Department of Justice restricts getting um, a search warrant for attorney files uh, to you have to consult the United States Attorney for that district. Not one of this is one of the issues where they're saying they're reserving it essentially to officers of the United States as opposed to mere employees. A mere employee has to go get the permission of an officer of the United States. Uh, but you know that's just an internal policy. Uh, I could they could write a policy that says uh, we will not apply for any search warrants uh, for you know, any reason except for on Friday afternoons and it has to be a guy in the office named Frank Smith. And then lo and behold, on Thursday, someone named Susan goes uh, and takes the files over to the court, uh, does all the, you know, the swearing out, whatever. Some agent does it, I'll say. Uh, do the, does the swearing out. The judge reads it and goes, oh, yes, I'm going to sign the search warrant. Oh, it looks good to me. Uh, you, know, you know, go with God. Hakamalika. You know, Gave Maria, whatever. You know, be blessed, my child. Hakamalika. And the person goes off and does the search. You can't walk into court and say, oh, well, the person who applied for the search warrant was named Susan, and she did it on a Thursday, rather than Frank uh, uh, doing it on a Friday, like the policy says. The judges can go, well, yeah, that's it's terribly interesting. Uh, that was clearly a very bad employee who can be subject to internal discipline within the agency. Uh, motion denied. Any, any other issues before the court? All right, let's break for lunch, y'all. Have a good day. It's just legally irrelevant. Another one is uh, this this notion that um, the you, you'll be able to bifurcate knowledge uh, in the government, so that way what uh, Prosecutor A does in the office won't be known by Prosecutor B, and therefore Prosecutor B will be immunized from the knowledge of Prosecutor A. Um, this is an interesting argument. It's one that the government makes uh, frequently. It doesn't make them anymore. You may have heard of some cases like Brady, and, and you'll hear things like Brady and his progeny. Um, discovery obligations of the government. The government uh, and the states and the federal government used to play hide the pickle with criminal defendants. There would be a file stuck in someone's office or filing cabinet that would not be actually disclosed to the prosecutor bringing a prosecution. And that prosecutor can actually walk into court and in good conscience say, uh, to my knowledge and belief, you know, X, Y, Z is the case, because the police or other prosecutors have hidden from him that file. And, uh, you know, so that attorney who walks in ignorant of those files is not doing, doing anything unethical. He can't disclose to a criminal defendant information that he personally doesn't have. He's not lying to the court. He's not cooperating in the game of hide the pickle. Others are doing it. So that way he won't have the knowledge when he goes into court, and therefore he can make arguments that he would not be able to make if he had that knowledge, at least if he's an ethical uh, lawyer. Spare me the jokes, I know. 99% of attorneys give the rest of them a bad name. And uh, the government love to play that game, and finally the courts are like, no, you know, people have constitutional rights. You don't get to frustrate those by the happenstance of what you don't tell the prosecutor. So in this whole line of cases from... Uh, you know, uh, discovery obligations, I'll just call it generally, uh, uh, case law has developed that requires the government to do certain things. One of which is that the prosecutor has an affirmative legal obligation to go seek out and find all relevant files in the possession of any agency in the government that has files that are relevant to this uh, potential prosecution. And then the prosecutor must disclose to defense counsel or to the defendant uh, sometimes just defense counsel, depending on the type of case, but that's putting that off the side, uh, national security issues, yada, yada, yada. Um, but in, in any event, they, have, they affirmatively have to go find the things in their files and disclose to the defense all information that uh, goes to either the defendant's guilt or to the degree to which he should be punished if he is found guilty. All information relevant to guilt or punishment. You can't hide something in a police file and then get a conviction and go in and justify the conviction by saying, well, the prosecutor who argued it didn't personally know. The prosecutor is not the one who is bringing the prosecution. He is the agent of the entity bringing the prosecution, which is the government itself. The government can't claim it doesn't know what it already knows. The government can only act through agents, officers, and employees, of course, 
because you know it's not a physical it's not a person they can't walk into court and go I'm the United States government your honor and you know, here's my position but the agent is uh, you know it, um, he's construct he constructively possesses the knowledge of his principal which is the government itself so he is imputed whether or not it is in fact true with knowledge of everything that the government knows now in a taint issue a taint team issue they want to say no Actually, the government doesn't know what the government knows. We're going to immunize this agent of the government from the knowledge of its principal. Now, I have said in previous uh, videos, and I'll say it you know, here again until the end of time, if you want to know what the government really wants to do with your legal rights, don't listen to press conferences where the people giving it have no obligation at all to be honest, uh, can't be sanctioned for lying to you, uh, as Bill Clinton said in his deposition, that was collected and then, oddly enough, released to the public, even though it was a grand jury deposition. It should not have been released to the public, but anyway. He said, look, the whole purpose behind the litigation was to get me in there under oath, in discovery, and just ask me a whole bunch of questions uh, and then leak it to hurt me politically, which is what this really is, and the judges should not participate in that. But in any event, the, uh, that's the whole reason that this is these types of things are going to be uh, gone through in respect of political figures. It's to get the information and then release it. But in any event, the government, if you want to know what it's going to do, listen to what it says. It wants the, the court to let it do because you can't walk into court and get the relief that you want unless you tell the court what you want the court to do for you. If you want your, uh, I don't know, a charge dismissed if you're a defense counsel, you have to walk into court and say, court, I want this case dismissed. I want this charge dismissed for X, Y, Z reasons. If you're the government and you want to, I don't know, be able to do something that you, that uh, some court or some agency has said that you can't do, when you go into court, you have to tell the court, this other court or this agency or this rule or this statute is wrong or should be interpreted this way to permit us to do this. So that way the court knows what it is you're asking it to do and then can either say, yes, we'll let you do that or no, we won't let you do that. But at a minimum, you have to tell the court what you want to do because you can't just wink and nod and the court will go, well, obviously, even though they argued X, what the government really wants is not X. No, you have to tell them, you know, tell them what you want and look, you know, they may give it to you, they may not. So here with the Taint team, uh, pay attention to the briefs that the government filed in the case. They want to walk into the Southern Dif District of New York and argue that these kinds of searches and seizures of attorneys' files are, com you know, they're fairly commonplace. It's it's sufficiently routine that they have a practice, uh, you know, that has arisen up around it. And then they cite a handful, a very small handful of cases, because it is not actually commonplace. There is not actually a practice of doing this. It uh, when they do it, it virtually goes nowhere. And the reason for it is that even though the judges might trust the integrity and honor of an individual United States attorney or an assistant United States attorney. The Constitution doesn't trust the say-so of the executive. If that were the case, we wouldn't need judges. Just well, Whatever the prosecutor says, obviously, if the courts are persuaded the prosecutor is honest and is only ever going to do right, if all of them are ever only going to, to do right by this rule, then just let it all in. It's all fine. No, the Constitution says we don't trust judges. We don't trust the executive. Uh, judges are not sufficiently competent without the defendant's uh, consent to decide issues of fact. That's for the jury. That's the, the citizenry's last opportunity for uh, democratic constraints or the, the will of the community to speak on a case and say, yeah, yeah, sure, the law says this and the facts, uh, you know, if we agree the facts prove that this is the case and that uh, it does in fact violate um, this statute applying these facts to that law. Nevertheless, we don't like the law, so we're going to nullify. You know, the jury has that absolute power. Um, to do that, to say, well, yep, uh, proved everything, we agree, not guilty, go away. <clears throat> um, so we don't trust judges to do that without the consent of the defendant. He has an absolute right to demand a jury trial. In fact, he'll be given a jury trial unless he affirmatively uh, petitions the court, says, hey, judge, I want a bench trial, not a jury trial. I want to, to plead my uh, facts before you, and then the judge gets to decide issues of fact. But the general principle in the Constitution is, Judges aren't good enough to decide issues of fact. They may address issues of law and uh, those only without the consent of the party who will be adversely affected by uh, one or other interpretation of the facts. So um, the government in this case uh, cited some of those cases like I mentioned, and one of which, which is pointed out by uh, Trump's law, uh, legal team, is a case in the Southern District of New Jersey, I think, maybe it was one of the districts in New Jersey anyway, 
where the government used one of these taint teams and then turned around and used the information that was supposedly uh, walled off by the taint team against the party in, in further proceedings. So the, you know, they said, oh no, there will be this big wall of China wrapped around the information. We won't know anything about it. And then suddenly, Mirabile Dictu, that information magically winds up in the hands of the prosecutor, or the prosecution, who then takes it forward into further proceedings against that party. You know, the information that they only could have gotten by looking through attorney files. Now, the other issue is the ticking time bomb uh, example, which is great for ethical considerations about torture and other types of things. Uh, it comes up in courts somewhat frequently. It is completely idiotic in respect of the law because it requires certain laws of physics to be broken and it uh, completely ignores how police officers, in fact, do work. If you want a good case of how you know, this stuff actually works, uh, look up the case of a guy named, um, you just Google him, he's called the Exploding Pizza Man. He was a guy, and this is Erie, Pennsylvania in 2003, and um, he had a bomb strapped around his neck and was told to go in and rob a bank, but he was actually part of the bank robbery team, but they double-crossed. Anyway, it's a whole thing. He gets blown up on the side of the road on national TV, or local TV at least, if not national. Uh, you may not remember this case. It's very interesting. So uh, there was a series of checkpoints he'd have to go to in order to get a new key to do something to the bomb that was strapped around him that would prolong the time until he gets to the last step in the process where he'd get the final key or whatever it is and that would uh, disarm the bomb and he could go free. Well, the police, after they stopped him, uh, realized that there was this trail of um, keys where he had to follow these clues and go go here, do this, do the other. And they get to the, uh, the end and lo and behold, uh, the key's not there. Uh, the guy blows up, he dies. Bomb makers typically take proactive, they take measures to protect their, their device. So that way, uh, either, you, their goal is to actually get it to blow up. But in any event, the laws of physics things I was talking about, in order for the police to go torture someone or beat them or whatever it is to get that code out of that person's head, the cops have to first know a few things. One, that uh, a bomb or a potential bomb exists. It is uh, disarmable by a code uh, and that a particular person uh, has that code or has uh, access to documents that have that code such that they can then go there and get that information. This is why the police didn't go around and just start randomly grabbing people off the side of the street and beating the shit out of them. Give us the code or the key or because that's not how it works. Police officers act on information that even the least competent, most malicious officer doesn't go around randomly targeting people to beat the shit out of them. They, you know, there's always some underlying reason. Some, you might not agree with it, and I won't in many of those cases, or in any of those cases, I should say. Uh, but there is some underlying process there. It could be animus of, ra of a racial type. It could just be complete mistakes of fact that no competent officer would make. But there is something where you can look at and go, oh yes, I see how, given this fact and that fact, uh, we wound up where we were uh, with this really terrible police officer. They don't just go around randomly grabbing people off the street and beating them up for information in this kind of way. So it's only when they know that there is that ticking time bomb that uh, they can begin to act at most. That, that's the fastest they could possibly act. Then they have to have some information that would lead them to believe that a particular person has the whatever you know, the secret code or whatever it is you require in order to disarm it. Well, in this case, that would be the information contained in the attorney's documents. Um, now, why it should be the case that the person would call his attorney to say, oh, the code to the bomb is, and the guy writes it down and that wouldn't be reported, is, com is completely mysterious to me because such information is not protected by attorney-client privilege at all. The attorney would have an affirmative obligation to seek out the police and disclose it. Um, and you wouldn't, so there wouldn't be any concern there with attorney-client privilege because it would be waived. The person has conspired with his client, if he did not call and disclose it, to engage in a criminal act. Attorney-client privilege waived. No big deal. So the only instances in which it's relevant is when there isn't an allegation that there is a conspiracy or fraud afoot. In other words, that it is a valid claim of attorney-client privilege to which the government has no entitlement, whatever, of any kind to have under any circumstances, except that they develop this taint team process, which is where the government won't know what the government knows. Now, um, some of the examples that have been brought up as well, the attorney could destroy it. Yeah, that's true. 
Um, but why that entitles the government to seize it and then read it is completely mysterious. They can do like they do in any other case where they think a person is going to go in some place and destroy evidence, and yet they don't have a warrant to get in there. You cordon off the area and let no one in. It's not in your control. You don't possess it. And it's not available to the person who constructively possesses it, which is to say, its owner. You have prevented the owner from having access to that while a warrant is sought. Now, in this case, any lawyer who's going to be, you know, a search warrant uh, is going to be, uh, um, you know, thrown against, is going to have a lawyer to represent his interests. And if he refuses to have a lawyer to represent his interests, that's fine. Then the court itself can get the materials and not, dis and so that way the, the, the state, the prosecutor, never gets its grubby little hands on it. Which, as I mentioned in the Clinton case on the, the uh, various things to do with Monica Lewinsky and Paula Jones, the reason they wanted him under oath somewhere was to get that information uh, out of him and then dis disclose it publicly in order to uh, hurt him politically, which is what happened time and time and time again. Uh, he, he, and you know the judge kept saying, "Now don't leak this," and the people kept leaking it in the Paula Jones case, and then in the uh, grand jury example, the reason that that had to be recorded was because one grand juror couldn't be there that day, and therefore they needed to have it on tape. Uh, that sounds good to me. And then you know it gets released. Who could have seen that coming? Well, you know Clinton did. Whatever you think of the guy. Um, that is just not how the legal system should work. Because once you start accepting that kind of process, then it shouldn't stop with your political enemies. I mean, I know you won't like it for your political allies, but that's just a detail. If it's a, if it's a rule of law, then it's a rule of law. I mean, we don't have two sets of laws, or we shouldn't have two sets of laws. One for, you know, people you like, and then one for people you don't like. Uh, you know, so, the, that, that's just really weird. So, the, uh, the ostensible way that the tank team works is, uh, is that um, prosecutors and agents read through all of the attorney's files, and then they, incidentally, they argued, unreviewably, uh, they get to determine what is and isn't privileged. Because, after all, who would know best what is privileged? The person to whom the privilege belongs, a.k.a. the client and his representative, or the, the adverse party, the interested adverse party, who's trying to bring one or the other of them to trial for something. So you trump up some charges, which may be legit for all I know, so I, I don't want to say trump up. They could be legitimate charges, which wouldn't otherwise be brought, but are here being brought because it's advantageous to get access to attorney-client protected material in order to have it to, re to release it, just say. Uh, and lo and behold, you get that kind of thing, and it, it comes on in. So, um, you know, the, the examples that, that the government gave are uh, a good reason why taint teams should just be uh, completely disfavored, unless a person consents to it, uh, by courts throughout the land, precisely because you can't trust the U.S. attorneys not to do exactly what they did in one of those cases, which is say, we'll use a taint team process, and this will wall it off, and then magically it gets in their hot little hands, and they take it into uh, proceedings and present it to uh, various adjudic uh, adjudicatory bodies uh, to the detriment of the person who... Um, had made these disclosures to his lawyer, which the government never should have been able to read, period. The idea that you can trust the police or uh, the U.S. attorney or prosecutor in general uh, to protect your interests when they're trying to prosecute you is completely retarded. Only a moron would possibly think that it's acceptable or, an, or intelligent to provide <laughs> to the people who are seeking to do you harm, all of the information necessary, potentially, to do you harm, on the promise they won't use it to do harm to you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I was born early in the morning, but it wasn't yesterday morning. So, that's the Taint Team. There are no circumstances, let me just reiterate this, there are no circumstances under which it should ever be tolerated. It is never, ever necessary. Uh, for Well, I remember the ticking time bomb thing, the bifurcation thing, the knowledge of the government thing, the, the uh, surreptitious passing from one prosecutor supposedly won't tell the other prosecutor, but in reality will tell the other prosecutor uh, because he's not the one in court. He hasn't made any ethical promises to the judge not to do something, even if he has. Well, who can control what his administrative assistant does? Oh, wait, he can. How can he control what his administrative assistant does? By disciplining them or not disciplining them. The sole recourse uh, for this kind of misconduct because, after all, 
internal policy documents for how which employees will do what. Do not fix any, do not establish any rights that any person who is on the wrong side of it can enforce in law because internal policies for what, how they prefer to do things for uh, operational convenience and administrative um, convenience do not uh, create legal rights for any party who's going to be on the losing end of that. The, uh, the way that gets resolved, if at all, is through internal discipline. There's never any circumstance to do a taint team because if information is in there that you require, all you have to do is wall it off uh, and then do what you do like they ordinarily do in all the cases where it's not uh, convenient, where the, the government really doesn't have a hard on to, to hurt someone. Uh, that person's attorney, and if the attorney is, is thought to maybe be possibly shady, then he gets an attorney who isn't thought to be shady, who will review the documents with the client and that lawyer, all of which will be covered by attorney-client privilege, and everything that has a claim of privilege will be put in a privilege log, and uh, the privilege log will be disclosed to the court, uh, subject to challenge by the opposing side. Each and every item on that list can be challenged. And then the judge will go through each and every item in camera and decide whether or not it's privileged or it isn't privileged or there's some exception or whatever it is. At no point will any of that information wind up in the hands of the prosecutor on the prosecutor's own initiative. He has to litigate it if he wants anything that uh, the, a defendant claims is privileged, as it should be. The government should never get its hands on any piece of information, whatever, that is privileged. Now, in respect of um, the, the ticking time bomb thing, I should mention, there are two issues in law enforcement which often go hand in hand, but they're actually two distinct issues and sometimes they come sharply apart. One of which is protection of the public, safety issues, and the other is prosecutions, getting, collecting evidence to prosecute. As I mentioned, in order for a police officer to act, he first has to have knowledge that the bomb exists or whatever the bad thing exists, and uh, that it leads to some particular person. All the information that he gets from that time that he's aware of these, this potential safety hazard up until he finds out where the person is because someone has, has to tell him. There has to be a note, so there has to be a witness, something like that. Uh, that's admissible. You know, he can use that, uh, the prosecutor can use that to prove up its case. The only thing that wouldn't be admissible is if they decide to torture the person to get the codes uh, and then go disarm the bomb, which, of course, the fact that the person has the codes would prove beyond any doubt that they have something to do with the bomb, but it wouldn't be able to be used because that person's rights would be violated. And we have here in the United States something called an exculpatory rule, which means that in various circumstances when the government acts illegally to seize evidence, it's excluded. The government doesn't get to manufacture, it doesn't get to violate your rights, manufacture the conditions by which knowledge, you know, that the Constitution protects the government, protects you from having to give the government. They don't get to conscript you into being an instrument of your own de de uh, demise by their unlawful conduct and then gain an advantage from doing that. So they, they can't go in and torture you to get the information to prove it, uh, and they can, they can get the information by torturing you, but when they go into court, the jury will never see it. The jury never gets to hear it. So the only thing that would fall out of the case would be that information that the government agent would, would get through doing something unlawful in order to defuse the bomb. And that's, that's a bit of a Hobbesian choice there for a police officer. You, you have to decide what is more important to you, stopping the bomb from going off or getting that piece of information uh, through some other, other way, in the codes, through some other means, in order to get a prosecution. It's a case where you can't do both. You have to pick which is much uh, more important to you, and any officer who chooses the prosecution over stopping a bomb from killing people is evil and should be fired straight away. Now, uh, since you know, so that's that's the right. The remedy there would be to suppress that information, and the person would have you know, criminal charges that they could bring against them for assault, which wouldn't go anywhere. No jury in the world is going to convict a guy for beating someone to get codes to a bomb that in fact stops the bomb. I mean, this is not going to happen. There's a tort that he could have. I don't think any jury in the land is going to convict someone making pay damages to a bomber who had the codes, uh, even though they were ill. You know, the, the officer engaged in bad conduct uh, because he did in fact stop the bomb from blowing up and killing everybody. We'll say uh, we don't really care. That's that jury nullification thing I talked about earlier. Assuming it even gets to trial, uh, a jury's going to. I my view is that any jury in the land would uh, nullify on that case and be like, yeah, <laughs> you're right. That officer acted very bad, and we're very happy that he did. Uh, we're not going to convict him. And the advantage there is it doesn't establish a rule of law. You have the general principle that officers shouldn't do X, Y, Z, but in extraordinary cases, the conscience of the community can say, 
We'll look the other way this time. It doesn't establish a rule of law. It doesn't immunize other officers. It just says that, you know, this Fourth Amendment should not be a suicide pact in this kind of way. And uh, we're smart enough to distinguish this case from the other case. So there's never any reason for these kinds of games. The Constitution is written precisely because uh, you should not trust the people who are trying to lock you away or put you to death to be the guarantor of your freedom. That's why we have an independent judiciary. That's why they've come up with the exculpatory rule and various disclosure obligations. In fact, the exculpatory rule and disclosure obligations arose precisely because of government misconduct, because the government proved that the founders are right. You can't trust the prosecutor to be the guarantor of the liberty of the person he's, uh, at that time, uh, you know, way back in, in, in centuries ago when every, practically everything was punishable by death, when they're the ones who are trying to put you to the sword or take away your liberty for the rest of your life or whatever. Make sure you die in a small cage. That is not your friend. Uh, your, your counsel is your friend and your counsel only. And that's why the privilege there is protected and it's why we, ex we exclude evidence that's improperly gained because the government should, the person who's trying to put you to death or put you away in a small cage, shouldn't get to unlawfully act and engineer circumstances where they come into possession of information they couldn't have gotten through any legal means and then use that against you. Nope, sorry. Uh, individual citizens don't get uh, you know, some exception from the law because of various reasons. Neither should the government. These constraints are put there to, to stop the government from doing certain things for the same reason that we have laws of general applicability that stop citizens from doing certain things. Unless there's an exception written right into the statute, or in this case the constitutional provision, you don't have an excuse. You know, common law defenses like duress and infancy apply and whatnot, unless they're abrogated by the legislature. You just, no, it is a, it is a, a limit beyond which you may not go. And if you do go, you suffer the consequences, which in this case the remedy is you lose that evidence. So congratulations, government. You did a lot of work, got some really good evidence, which is going to go in the trash can. It'll never see the light of day. Well played, government. Well played. Uh, next case. So that's my view on that. Uh, I'm glad we got an opportunity to, mas to massage the government's taint. <laughs> Have a great day.